Some claim that it's the world's oldest cheese, possibly dating back to the 8th century BC, or even earlier. More recently, in the 1990s, the question of which countries have the right to produce this cheese has been disputed in the European Union. Let's learn about the history of feta. Hey there, cheese historians. I'm Julia, and this is Cheese History a channel all about the origins, history, and impact of cheese. Today we're looking at the history of feta, and we have to start way back in the Greek Dark Ages with Homer's Odyssey. The origins of feta are disputed. There are claims that the cheese made by Polyphemus in Homer's Odyssey is an early form of feta. Uh, let's have a look at what Homer has to say about Polyphemus' cheesemaking. It took us very little time to reach the cave, but we did not find its owner at home. He was tending his fat sheep in the pastures, so we went inside and looked in amazement at everything. There were baskets, or racks, laden with cheeses, and the folds were thronged with lambs and kids. At last he came up, shepherding his flocks. He sat down to milk his ewes and his bleating goats, which he did methodically, putting her young to each mother as he finished. He then curdled half the white milk, collected the whey, and stored it in wicker cheese baskets. The remainder he left standing in pails, so that it would be handy at supper time when he wanted a drink. Unfortunately, it's at this point that Polyphemus discovers the Greek warriors in his cave, so we never find out whether he was going to brine his cheese or rub salt on the outside. If he had brined his cheese, there would have been a good case that this is a precursor to feta. An argument against this being feta is that Odysseus and his men found cheese aging in the cave, which they helped themselves to for dinner. The cheeses are on trasu which are a wicker basket or a woven mat of some kind. So while Polyphemus is using the right types of milk to make feta, sheep and goat's milk, he appears to be air drying his cheese on some sort of rack or a mat. I think a woven basket is less likely than a mat because there are many cheeses as the mats or baskets are laden or weighed down. And I can't see how having many cheeses in a basket would help age the cheese a basket would not be able to hold brine effectively either because it's not watertight, so some kind of mat is more likely. I don't think we can say with any certainty that this is feta that Polyphemus is making, based on the little information Homer gives us. Of course, if he had given us the whole process, we could have more certainty. There is a traditional Greek cheese that Alexis Adams suggests could be an ancestor of feta. Tulumaturi is a sheep and goat's milk cheese that is stored and aged in the skins of sheep and goats, which have been salted and tanned. Yes, you heard that right, that's the skin of a sheep or a goat. Obviously without the sheep or goat still in it, it's just the skin. The name Tulumaturi comes from the Greek words tulumi, meaning animal skin, and turi, meaning cheese. It's still made in parts of Greece today, and I will put links to a couple of blog posts uh, by Adams in the description below. Adams went to visit cheesemakers in the Peloponnese Peninsula who were still using traditional methods to make this cheese, including aging it in animal skins. And it's worth a read if you're interested in these sort of traditional methods of cheesemaking. The way tulimaturi is stored is different to feta, a salted animal skin as opposed to a salt brine. I haven't been able to find a great deal of information about this cheese and its history, but it makes me wonder if the salt brine was an earlier or later development to make storing cheese easier. It's hard to say for sure, but I don't think we should rule out Tulimaturi as an ancient predecessor to feta. The brine is what makes feta distinct in this case, so what do we know about the history of aging cheeses in brine? Feta is a very salty cheese because it's stored in brine, which is basically very salty water. 
The brine helps preserve feta as the addition of salt hinders the growth of microbes in the cheese. It also helps dry feta out by drawing out moisture, which explains why feta is so crumbly despite spending so much time in liquid. Being submerged in brine also prevents airborne moulds developing on the surface of the cheese, which can cause it to spoil. Today, feta is often dry salted first, then later stored in brine, or stored covered in salt which is dissolved by the moisture coming out of the feta, which creates a briny liquid. Brine cheeses are mentioned by Cato the Elder in the 2nd century BC in De Agricultura. Recipe for bleaching salt. Break off the neck of a clean amphora, fill with clear water and place in the sun. Suspend in it a basket filled with common salt and shake and renew from time to time. Do this daily, several times a day, until the salt ceases to dissolve for two days. You can find when it is saturated by this test. Place a small dried fish or an egg in it, and if it floats, you have a brine strong enough to pickle meat or cheese or salted fish. Cato's instructions are for a saturated brine, meaning that as much salt as possible is dissolved in the water. Cheese, and most other things, will float just below the surface of such a brine. So we know that brining cheese happened during Cato's lifetime, and likely had its origins much earlier. This means that something like feta could have been made at this time too. Brining cheese is corroborated by Roman author Columula in the 1st century AD, who mentioned brine in two of his descriptions of how cheese is made. Cheese which is to be eaten within a few days, while still fresh, is prepared with less trouble for it is taken out of the wicker baskets and dipped into salt and brine and then dried a little in the sun. Cheese also, which is hardened in brine and then coloured with the smoke of apple tree wood or stubble, has a not unpleasant flavour. Neither of these is likely to be an early form of feta. The first is a very young cheese that doesn't appear to spend much time in brine, whereas feta is often aged for at least two months and sometimes up to six. The second is smoked, while it's possible to smoke feta, it's not one of its traditional characteristics. Paul Kinstead also mentions another document that suggests that brine cheeses have ancient roots. Another reference to the use of salt water or salt brine to preserve cheese occurred later in the Geoponica, a 10th AD compilation of agricultural writings that draws from sources written much earlier, some of which ultimately may date back to the Hellenistic period, circa 3rd century BC and before. The Geoponica notes that cheese remains white when stored in brine, almost certainly a reference to the storage of acidic white or feta type cheese in brine. The evidence for this is circumstantial. Brine was likely available, the Canaanites shipped goods in jars, and cheese was shipped from the Canaanite city of Ashdod to Ugarit, a city on the Syrian coast that was a vassal of the Hittites at the time and it's not difficult to imagine that brine was also an early discovery, as Kinstead explains. Thus, it is possible that the Canaanite cheeses shipped to the Bronze Age port of Ugarit were rennet coagulated brined white cheese of the same family as feta, packed in clay-sealed Canaanite jars. Brined white cheeses are produced traditionally almost everywhere throughout the Near East, Eastern Mediterranean and Aegean regions. They are very simple to make and can withstand the hot, dry Mediterranean summers without spoiling and drying out due to their high salt content, protective brine and sealed packaging. It is likely that the use of brine for storing and preserving white cheese developed very early in the history of rennet coagulated cheese making. The preservative value of brine must have become evident soon after the practice of dry salting cheese became widespread because uncooked, unpressed, acidic, high moisture white cheese similar to feta naturally releases large amounts of salty whey upon dry salting. Thus salted white cheeses form their own natural brine, especially when stored at warm temperatures. When cheese is packed tightly in a skin bag or ceramic pot, the salty whey accumulates and forms a protective brine bath. Once again, it's impossible to know for sure when feta developed from these early brined cheeses, but it is possible that these early cheeses are feta's ancestors. Let me know in the comments how far back you think the origins of feta go. If the ancient origins of feta are uncertain, when does feta as we know it today appear? The 
first recorded mention of Feta is in a poem called On Medicine by Michael Psellus, who lived in the 11th century in the Byzantine Empire. Andrew Dalby writes, The cheese available in Greece begins in the Byzantine text to resemble more closely the range that we know from the modern Aegean. Mesithra is recognisable, so is Feta under its medieval name Prophatos. Prophatos, containing plenty of salt, is soft, pleasant to taste and nourishing. Poem on medicine. So feta is being made around a thousand years ago on Crete, and by the sounds of things is similar to the salty cheese produced in Greece today. Dolby also includes the following quotation from Pietro Casola, a pilgrim who arrived in Chania on Crete in 1497. They make a great many cheeses. It is a pity they are so salty. I saw great warehouses full of them, some in which the brine, or salmoria as we would say, was two feet deep, and the large cheeses were floating in it. Those in charge told me that the cheeses would not be preserved in any other way, being so rich. They do not know how to make butter. They sell a great quantity to the ships that call there. It was astonishing to see the number of cheeses taken on board our own galley. Crete appears to have been something of an epicentre of feta production for about 500 years and was exporting the cheese on ships. Where they were exporting it to, Casola doesn't say. In the 19th century, the Greek word feta became the widespread name of this brine cheese, but it dates back to around the 17th century. It is said to come from the Italian word feta, or slice, and likely refers to the practice of slicing the cheese in order to pack it into barrels. So the name feta is quite recent, but as we have seen, there is evidence that suggests that the cheese itself could have a history several thousand years old, possibly dating back to the Canaanites. At the very least, it dates back 1,000 years when it was made on Crete. Feta's possible ancient origins have led to conflict in the European Union over who has the right to make feta. Protected Designation of Origin, or PDO, is a label given by the European Union for a product made to specific specifications in a particular geographical location using set production methods. Many European cheeses have PDO status, which means that other parts of the EU cannot market cheeses under those names. Some styles of cheese allow generic production to continue alongside the PDO stuff. For example, Camembert can be made anywhere in the EU, but Camembert de Normandie is a PDO cheese and can only be made under set conditions in certain parts of France. While many European cheeses have PDO status, none is perhaps more controversial than feta. In 1994, Greece applied for PDO status from the EU for feta, which was granted in 1996. As a result of the European Commission's ruling, only cheeses produced from sheep's milk and up to 30% goat's milk using traditional methods in specific regions of Greece may bear the name feta. There are seven PDO regions for feta production. Thessaly, Epirus, Central Mainland Greece, Macedonia, Thrace, the Peloponnese Peninsula, and the northeastern Aegean island of Lesbos. Interestingly, Crete is not on that list, whereas the firmest evidence I have found for the production of feta is on Crete. Gaining PDO status meant that within the EU, for a cheese to be called feta, it had to meet all of these standards, being made with sheeps and up to 30% goat's milk, using traditional methods in certain regions of Greece. At the time, many other countries in Europe had large markets for feta and were producing a lot of their own. Denmark, Germany and France challenged Feta's PDO status, claiming that the name Feta was a generic term. Feta's PDO status was overturned in 1999 because of these challenges. Following more investigation, Greece was again granted PDO status for Feta in 2002. Challenges from other countries were again dismissed in 2005. Countries outside the EU tend to pay little attention to these rulings, making feta from any kind of milk, including cow, goat, sheep, and even water buffalo milk, and marketing it as feta. Several countries in the EU continue to protest against it, including Denmark. Greece regularly takes out legal action against these countries who market their cheese as feta, even for export to countries beyond the EU. The most recent case I could find is from 2018, when the EU requested that Denmark take steps to address companies who were getting creative by labelling their export white cheese as feta when shipped to non-EU countries. Nothing seems to have been done, so in 2020, legal proceedings began in the EU courts against Denmark. 
Due to feta having PDO status, other parts of Europe still make feta, but have to call it white cheese, feta with two T's, salad cheese, or some other name. Even though in the EU cheese sold as feta will have been made in Greece, the same cannot be said for feta in the rest of the world. So if you want to ensure you are getting Greek feta, unless you live in the EU, you may want to check the country of origin before you buy. I hope you enjoyed learning about the history of feta. If you did, please subscribe for more adventures of discovery into the history of different cheeses. Share this video with anyone you think will be interested in cheese and its history. You can also follow me over on Instagram and support me on Patreon. Researching these videos takes a lot of time and effort and any support will help me get more resources and find more information about the cheeses I cover on this channel. That's all for this time on Cheese History.